Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the bridge. We are very happy that you all are here and looking forward to being able to hear from God and connect with each other. So uh, we're going to have Jeff kind of come and share a couple things as well, and, uh, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, stand and, and sing. And, uh, but we are very excited that you're here today. Good morning. Um, obviously, it's a holiday weekend, and it's a very important holiday weekend. Uh, Memorial Day gives us an opportunity to take time out to recognize those uh, from our country who have paid the ultimate price on behalf of our freedom. And uh, hopefully the rest of today and tomorrow, uh, when you're with family and friends and celebrating, you'll take some time to remember those. Um, but every day, especially on Sunday, uh, we like to come together to uh, remember the one who paid the ultimate sacrifice for each and every one of us. Amen. And that's Jesus Christ. So go ahead and stand up and let's enter this time of praise and worship this morning with a song, Jesus I Come. Out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus I come. Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to be out of my sickness into thy health, out of my wanting and into thy will, out of my sin and into thyself. Jesus, I come to Thee. Out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the glorious gain of Thy cross. Jesus, I come to Thee. Out of earth's sorrows into thy ball, out of life's storms and into thy calm, out of distress into jubilant song, Jesus I come to thee. Out of unrest and arrogant pride, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come, into thy blessed will to abide, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of myself to dwell in thy love, out of despair into raptures above, Upward forever on wings like a dove, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the fear and dread of the two, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the joy and light of thy home. Jesus, I come to Thee. Into the depths of ruin untold, into the peace of Thy sheltering fold, ever Thy glorious face to behold. Jesus, I come to Thee. Jesus, I come to thee. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated as Nick comes uh, to bring us a scripture reading this morning. Good morning. Uh, in the Gospels, Jesus says many times that supernatural healing and casting out of demons are a sign of the kingdom at hand. Um, and you see, you don't have to look very far into the book of Acts to be able to see this kingdom coming. Um, And Acts chapter 3 is one of these examples. You see, Peter and John are used by God uh, in an amazing healing of a crippled beggar. And understandably, crowds of people 
are astonished by this, and they swarm to what we could call today as Solomon's front porch. Um, and Peter, once again, comes in clutch after seeing Jesus risen, and he takes the opportunity to preach a sermon to what he calls the men of Israel. So let's go ahead and read that scripture now. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that this Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. I whom heaven receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who come after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. All right, we're going to go ahead and sing a couple more songs, so if you'll go ahead and stand. We're going to start with, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. Where your blood 
There's no greater love than this. You have overcome the grave. Glory fills the highest place. What can separate me now? You go. You shield my way. Your hands uphold me. I know you love me. At the cross I bow my knee, where your blood was shed for me. There's no greater love than this. You have overcome the grave, the glory fills the highest place. What can separate me now? You tore the veil, you made a way. When you said that it is done, you tore the veil, you made a way. Glory fills the highest place. What can separate me now? At the cross I bow my knee, where your blood was shed for me. There's no greater love than this. You have overcome the grave. The glory fills the highest place. What can separate me Father, as we come this morning, as we prepare to hear your word, Father, we pray that you just fill this place with your presence. Surround us with your Holy Spirit and speak to us in a mighty way today so that as we leave this place, we are challenged but ready to set our path with yours, to come alongside you for the good of all the kingdom. Father, we pray that you use Pastor Stephen today to speak to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And this is that time when any kids, third grade on down, make their way out of the sanctuary. If you've not received a blue bracelet, uh, then there's someone at a table back there that can hook you up with everything you need to make sure you get your kid back at the end of church today. And the children are going to learn and hear the same message that was read in front of everybody 
on their level and uh, gives you opportunity to talk to your children that might be taking advantage of hearing that same message on their level as well. Um, and as the kids make their way down to uh, the area where they'll hear that message, I just, uh, we're going to pray for them in a second, but just want to say that the congregational singing of Lord, you are more precious than silver uh, was a huge blessing for me kind of standing in the front pew to hear that. I think it's amazing the way that God moves and responds of his people just being overwhelmed with joy and, and grateful for uh, God who truly is more precious than silver and more costly than gold. So if you please pray for me, we're going to pray for our children and then just pray that our ears will be attentive to hear what God has for us today. So, Father, thank you so much that you love us, that you demonstrated your love for us and that while we were still sinners, you sent your son Jesus to die for us. Where we are grateful, we are excited, and we know also that the children that are here today are precious in your sight, and we ask boldly by the power of your Holy Spirit that you may cause them to know how deep your love is for them, and that they would be overwhelmed with joy in your presence. Lord, we pray that you may speak mightily to us through your word and through your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So chapter three of Acts is a little bit long and there is all kinds of good stuff, but it was mentioned already that this is a holiday weekend. So if I preach for like two hours, you know, y'all have Monday to kind of still recover and catch up. So everybody's good with me going significantly longer to cover all this stuff, right? <laughs> We won't do that, I don't think. But uh, chapter 3 begins with Peter and John walking to the temple at the hour of prayer. And the English Standard Version has this first word, now. The New International Version has one day. And I want to camp out just on that one day or now. Because right now is the now. And then the NIV says one day. It doesn't say that it was a day that was necessarily more special than any other day. It was just one day. And as we think about what that one day looks like, I want you guys to kind of get inside of your head. That could be today. It could be today that God is going to do something extraordinary that is going to transform my life or transform someone's life that I care about. Happens now. Happens one day. But Peter and John are doing something very important on this one day that I believe is connected to allowing them to be able to see God work. It says that it was at the hour of prayer and they are headed to the temple to pray. If any of you have ever been to a prayer meeting before, there's uh, different kinds of prayer meetings. Uh, there's prayer meetings where, well, they sound like diagnosis of the hospital, kind of. So-and-so has this ailment with such-and-such -and, such, and we want to pray for this person. And there's nothing wrong with praying for people that are sick. The Bible tells us we're supposed to. But every once in a while, you might be able to be with another group of believers and you may meet for prayer. And all of a sudden, something happens in the midst of prayer, whether it's you speaking to God or God speaking to you. Where like maybe you don't even want to open your eyes, but you think like, if I open my eyes right now, I think like that if I could see God, like I think he came and visited us in a special way. The Bible has ways to describe God's presence, that in God's presence there's fullness of joy. There is a peace that passes all understanding. You know, it's real cool, though, when you've experienced that peace that passes all understanding, you know what you want to do? 
you want to try to explain it even though it's unexplainable because it's so cool. Peter and John haven't even made it to the prayer meeting yet. They're on the way. But it does remind me of a story that I heard one time about a, a drought during summertime. And the people in the church, a lot of them are farmers, and they're dependent upon the rain. So they decide, well, God controls the rain. So we're just going to uh, go and pray, and we're going to pray for rain. We don't need to pray for rain right now based on how much it's rained in our area. But they were praying for rain, and as they were praying for rain, there was a little girl that marched into the prayer meeting, and she had something in her hand, a bright red umbrella. They all met for prayer, and, and the pastor saw this little girl with the bright red umbrella. And he said, thank you all for coming to pray for rain. But this little girl came expecting that God was going to answer the prayer. God brought you here today. Some of you may say, no, that was my mom and dad that told me I got to come. Maybe God used your mom and dad to get you here. But God brought you here. Maybe there's another friend that God used to kind of prompt you to be here. But God brought you here. And God wants you to have your symbolic red umbrella today. And say, God, I don't know what exactly you're going to do. If we're all honest with each other, we don't even really know what we need. But God knows what we need. And God will give you what you need today. So uh, just imagine that red umbrella as we move on with the sermon. As they're on their way, in verse 2 it says, A man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. So there's this lame man that is being carried and he's sat at this gate and it's a strategic place for him to sit because the people who go to the temple to worship have actually been told that if you want to score some brownie points with God, that you'll give to the people who are begging outside the temple. So it's a good spot for him to be at, but if we've ever ran across someone that's begging before and you don't want to give to them, what do you do? You, you, you do everything you can to avoid eye contact. You're like, okay, I, I just need to play pretend that this person's not there. And you know what the beggar's doing? The beggar's doing everything they can to try to lock eyes with you to say, okay, well maybe, just maybe they'll give me something. Verse 3 says that the beggar first saw Peter and John about to go into the temple and he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him. Somebody said one time that looking leads to loving. And I don't know that, that that's always the case, but I do believe that if you are establishing eye contact with someone, that that often leads to loving. Now, I understand there's also several kinds of looks. Most of you maybe have a parent that has the look. And the look is intimidating enough to where it could kind of lock eyes with you, but you want to dodge the look, okay? You don't want that kind of look. This look is a look of look here. It's, it's a locking of eyes. Bill Hybels, who's the pastor at Willow Creek Community Church, said one time that you need to know this. You will never, ever lock eyes with another individual that God does not love, that he has not made, that Christ has not died for. So what's that mean then for us? It means that even the way that we look at other people, it matters. And that that looking ought to lead to loving. 
And it's challenging to do in today's day and age because what do we have? We have these cool phones that do text messaging and Facebook and Twitter and you can dialogue all kinds of things with no face-to-face contact at all. It's okay for announcements, but it's not good for building relationships. It's not good for really connecting. So Peter actually then looks and gazes at this person, and then Peter says, look at us. Well, he's a beggar, right? So he's going to be somewhat ashamed um, as he's looking. Uh, I got to go to Prague over in Czech Republic several years ago. Uh, Beautiful place, um, but there were tons of beggars in this city. But the way that they begged was different than the way we beg here. They got all the way down on their knees and then you couldn't see them at all and they lifted up their hands like that and they would go down as low as they possibly could just with their hands up so this beggar i think in my the way my imagination works he wanted to lock eyes with peter and john but then he was kind of ashamed so he's not really wanting to look and then peter says this is important I want you to look at us. So the beggar looks at Peter and John and expects to receive something from them. And Peter says, I have no silver and I have no gold. One commentator said at this point, if there would have been a pause, it's possible that they could have said, this guy's just making fun of me then. He wants me to look at him, but he's not going to give me what I need. Which then causes us to beg the question, is silver and gold really what this guy needs? Because then Peter goes on to say, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get and walk. Rise and walk. What did Peter have? Peter had a vibrant, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Peter knew Jesus in a way to where Jesus can accomplish anything and do anything, and prompted by the Holy Spirit, Peter says, this is what I have, and I'm going to give you this. And in fact, what I have is better than what you're asking for. And then this is beautiful. Peter takes this blind man by the hand and helps lift him up. I don't know about you, but uh, I believe this. Okay, it's probably good because I'm a pastor. But I am a mixture of faith and doubt. I am a mixture of belief and unbelief. I'm a mixture of sinner and saint. And I need people in my life. I need brothers and sisters in Christ that when I don't have what I need can say, let me give you what I have. And in fact, I'm not going to just say, rise up and walk. I'm going to grab your hand and help lift you up. I think this might have been a flashback experience for Peter. You guys remember enthusiastic Peter when Jesus is walking on water and Jesus tells Peter, or Peter tells Jesus, if it's you, then tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, come, and Peter's coming, and as long as his eyes are fixed on Jesus, Peter's doing great, but then all of a sudden, Peter begins to look at the wind and the waves, and Peter begins to sink, and Peter cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus does not go, well, you know what, you should have had more faith, I'm just going to let you drown. Jesus looks at Peter and the Bible says immediately Jesus goes 
to grab Peter and pulls him up. Sometimes, some religious people tend to paint a picture that failure is final. Jesus does not ever paint that picture. Jesus paints the picture of failure when you're wise enough after you failed to cry out to me for help actually gets you closer to me than if you thought you could succeed on your own. So this idea that God will not accept me if he knows about the skeletons in my closet. Newsflash, he already knows about the skeletons in your closet. And he just wants you to agree that those things are not good and to turn them over to him and say, I'm drowning here, God. I need help. Save me. And immediately happens. So I don't know, was Peter thinking as he said, rise and walk, I'm going to do for this crippled beggar what Jesus did for me. What has Jesus done for you? And how might Jesus be calling you today to do for someone else what Jesus has done for you? What happens after this? It says, He took him by the right hand, raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Somebody said, you know, Dr. Luke, okay, he's a doctor, and he's trying to highlight here the miraculous of this is an immediate thing, that his ankles and feet are made strong. And then it says, leaping up, he stood and began to walk. I want you guys to count how many times the word walk or walking shows up here. So we, first thing, he stood and began to walk, number one, I'll help you count, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them. This man goes from crippled to walking to weeping to praising God. And I don't think his praise was contained. His praise was equivalent of what my dad and my brother and I did after the Cardinals came back from a huge deficit against the Washington Nationals in Game 5 this past postseason. Okay? And it was very late at night, and we didn't care. And I don't know. We, I was over at my parents' house. I don't know if we woke my mom up or not. Um, she's giggling, so maybe we did. Um, or maybe she was up, too. I'm not sure. But there was an enthusiastic like, we cannot contain ourselves here. The Cardinals have come back, and they did it with Daniel Descalzo and Pete Cosma, the most unlikely small ball St. Louis Cardinals. This is the way we like baseball type thing. It wasn't contained. The Bible says in another place, don't put out the Spirit's fire. When God has done something great and mighty for you, leaping and jumping are appropriate. This is a man that we find out in the next chapter is 40 years old. This is a culture where to be a dignified man, you don't do those kind of things. God has moved in this person's heart. And he wants to shout it from the rooftop. So he is going into this prayer meeting where everybody else goes into. And now all the people are flocking around and they're saying, what in the world is this? And they've got amazement. And they're like, wait a second. That's the guy I gave 10 bucks to yesterday. And now today he's walking. What the deal? Maybe was he fake? Was he? And people know it's not, it's not fake. And people know that a guy that's been crippled from birth he doesn't just get up and, and walk, so they know that something God-sized has happened here. And if you push the rewind button on your life, 
and you pay very close attention, you will discover that there are many, many God-sized things that have happened in your life. And some of you are like, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Go back and replay your life. And I guarantee you they're there. And if I replay my life, I, there's a mixture of sometimes where I'm weeping and praising God. And then there's sometimes where maybe I've been praying for something and what in fact I actually do after it happens is, good job, Stephen. You know, I was praying about that. I must have prayed with just an incredible amount of faith and, and all this stuff might have happened or, you know, it was because of that connection that I had there. That's the reason why this worked out. And before I know it, there's this piece that's kind of gone. And because it's important to give credit where credit is due. And that's what Peter goes on to do. He's got this huge crowd around. And as Nick shared earlier, Peter once again comes through at clutch time. And it's interesting that this chapter 11, this guy who is crippled, who's been healed, who's walking and jumping... Verse 11 describes, he clung to Peter and John. He's clinging to them. He's not clinging to them because his legs don't work. I think he's clinging to them because he can't stop hugging them. Okay, it's like this incredible embrace. Like, you guys, you guys gave me something better than silver or gold. I can walk. I can walk into the temple. I can pray. I can praise God. So he won't let Peter and John go. And now they're at this porch, Solomon's porch. And it says, when Peter saw it, all these people. And by the way, guys, um, when genuine praise of God happens, people see. Let me tell you something else people see. And I'm guilty of it sometimes. But when Christians are unhappy and complain and bitter, people see. So whether we're praising God and filled with the Spirit or the Spirit's leaked out of us and we're bitter and we're angry or whatever, regardless, people see. Some people are like, well, I don't really know how to witness. What? You are a witness. Like, and I know what they mean by that, but you are a witness. The better question is, what kind of witness are you? Because every single one of us are a witness. And this, blind, this uh, beggar is, is witnessing in, in profoundly powerful ways. And now Peter addresses the crowd and says, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Is it just me or is that an interesting question to ask? It would make sense to wonder at this when a guy's been crippled since he was 40 and now he's jumping up and praising God. But Peter's doing something very strategic here. And then he says, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? What Peter's doing here is he's saying, I see that your attention is on this crippled man that's now healed. That's not where it should be. I see also that your attention is on John and I. And that's not where it should be either. And then he says, this is where it should be. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. There's some important things to kind of gather here, okay? The Jews, the men of Israel, have referred to God as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of their fathers, their God. What Peter is doing here is he's establishing common ground and saying the same God who you're here to pray to and worship has done something that you missed. He glorified his servant, Jesus. And he's where we need to get to. He is the centerpiece. 
of this whole thing called Christianity. Not only was he glorified, but right after that, Peter says, you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life. During the Pentecost sermon, I used this, but it's worth using again that, you know, you always heard pointing the finger, not a good idea because there's other fingers pointed back at you. Peter only pointed the finger one time in his Pentecost sermon. Guess how many times he points the finger this time? Four times. He says, you delivered him over. You denied him. You denied him. You killed him. You know, judge, jury, sentence, boom. Peter took care of all of it. He said, you killed the author of life. You killed the holy and righteous one. It was not too far away from Jesus' crucifixion to where it's very likely that some of the very people who were yelling on Good Friday, crucify him, were actually at the temple praying on this day. Good news is really good news when you hear the bad news first. That's the bad news. Jesus is the glorified servant of God, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Bad news, you killed him, you're guilty, you're culpable. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. You killed him, but God raised him. This is not about you. It's all about God. And it's all about God bringing you back. The bridge, church, the cross builds a bridge uniting us to God. We have killed the author of life because of our sin, but God raised him from the dead. It goes on to say, we are witnesses of this. It's also interesting that Peter uses the word deny two times. My students at Evangelical better remember this. What did Peter do three times on Good Friday before Jesus rose from the dead? He denied that he knew Jesus. So Peter is saying you, but he's owning some of this himself too. I can't help but not think that when Peter uses the word deny that he is thinking about, and so did I deny. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses. And then verse 16, And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health and the presence of you all. In the Gospels, Jesus has performed physical miracles where he's healed people. And some of those folks were also spiritually healed. This guy receives a physical and a spiritual healing. It's said that he, because of faith in the name of Jesus, he's been given perfect health. This is a shalom, wholeness, and peace. Some of you are sick. And all of us, physically speaking, are terminally ill. We just don't know how we're going to die yet. But unless Jesus comes back again, the death ratio is pretty crazy. It's one to one. And this crippled beggar, whose legs were strengthened to him, recognizes that just as silver and gold is a temporary thing 
Physical healing is a temporary thing. But there is such a thing as eternal healing. There is such a thing as spiritual healing that allows us to one day die, but as Jesus said, one day you will die, but you will live again. Everyone who believes in me will live again. And because of faith in the name of Jesus, we can be promised that. Verse 17 goes on and says, I know, brothers, you acted in ignorance. He's giving these guys a pass now? Not really. Verse 18, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. And verse 19 says, repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. I read this past week that oftentimes we as people will be the worst, most harsh critic of ourselves. Now, not everybody's this way. We may know a few people that are like, oh my goodness, I can't believe they're not doing any kind of self-evaluation at all. And they're acting like a complete obnoxious person here. But the majority of us, we beat ourselves up. And our sins are constantly accusing us. Jesus died so that our sins may be blotted out. There's a psalm by Cadman's Call, and one of the lines goes like this. Your past can be like sidewalk chalk if you will dance and pray for rain. They'll be wiped out. Your sins can be wiped out because Jesus paid the price. Not only can your sins be wiped out, it goes on to say that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It can be good. Again, not only are your sins wiped out, but you can have a new energy and a new joy and a new zest for life by having faith in the name of Jesus. And it says Jesus is going to come and Jesus is going to make all things new, all things better. And then there's this huge list of prophecies that have been fulfilled about Jesus in the Old Testament. And we're actually only going to hit on 23 and then 26. Verse 23 says, and this is from Moses, It shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. It's a guy named uh, John Piper who pastors up in Minneapolis. And, and he wrote this book called Don't Waste Your Life. And I love the intro of this book because the intro of this book says, a lot of times people think you've got to know a lot of stuff about a lot of things in order to really be successful. But that is not true. You really have to know one thing. But you have to be so incredibly gripped by this one thing, that it changes the way you do everything. That one thing that we have to know, that has to so grip us that it changes the way we do everything, in the words of John Newton, is this. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, and now I see amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And Jesus is the one who is the Savior. He is the risen and reigning King. And listening to him communicates I'm found, I can see, I'm whole, he healed me. The true spirit-filled Christian never ever gets over the fact that they were saved, that they were rescued. And it's not so much teaching about how I've arrived, but that 
One came from heaven to earth to free me, to save me, to help me, to transform me. And you give all that you have to this one who gave all that he had to you. Not because you must, but because you want to. You know that he was the only one that could open your blind eyes and make you see. And then verse 26 says, God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from wickedness. We believe at the bridge that the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone for the glory of God alone. So that no one boasts and all boasting goes to the great God who saved us. But this great God who saves us goes to the very people who were most responsible for killing the Savior and comes to them not with judgment, but with mercy and grace. And he says, I have come to you first. The very people who hung Jesus, my son, on the cross, I'm coming to you not to condemn you, but to rescue you and to free you. And I'm coming to you first to bless you so that you may turn from your wickedness and turn to Jesus. So what is God calling us to do today? Number one, I believe God wants us to acknowledge that we are crippled. Spiritually, we can't walk apart from Jesus. Number two, I believe God wants us to acknowledge that we don't know it all and that we need help. Because sometimes we ask for silver and gold. We ask for things that fade away. And God wants to give us eternal things. For some of you, God is calling you today to say, man, I need to look deeply into another person's eyes. And I need to ask God to give me love for them like God has given to me. I need to really look and gaze deeply. And for others of you, there is this, uh, Jesus, you delivered up. You denied. You denied. You killed the author of life. When I was dating Daria, we uh, talked a lot about spiritual things. We still do. Um, but I'll never forget this one when we were dating. I was beating myself up for something that I had done. And she made this comment. She said, Stephen, you understand Good Friday, but you often forget about Easter Sunday. You need to experience Good Friday. You delivered him. You denied him. You denied him. You killed the author of life. But if you stop there, you're stuck in your sin. You need to get to Easter. It says, but God raised him to life. And now this author of life comes to you and says, I want to give you new life and God comes to us and says I want to bless you I want to bless you by helping you turn from wickedness and turn to my son Jesus I had breakfast with a guy this past Friday morning and uh, he's had a lot of pastoral experience too and he said at the end of the day what it all comes down to for Christians is we need to communicate there is 
imminent danger. And there is one who can rescue from the danger. And to do just one or the other is a disservice. But to do both, there is imminent danger, but there is a rescuer, and his name is Jesus. Enables people to have hope and joy. Let's pray together. Father, we, uh, I want to learn more about what it means to walk and leap and praise you. And Father, I ask that you may enable us this morning to walk and leap and praise you. That we may know this morning that we were blind, but now we see you. We were lost, but now we're found because Jesus has come to rescue us. And we pray, Father, that you may impress these truths upon our hearts in a way that causes us to be transformed and to look more like your son, Jesus. It's all about him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing. wish everybody a, a wonderful rest of Memorial Day weekend and just have a couple of other uh, quick announcements and then we're going to do a benediction here also. Um, there is a desire on the part of many of us to want to do life together uh, and apparently there was an article in the Telegraph yesterday uh, about some of those things that we are wanting to cast a vision about uh, for the bridge to be about. And some of that's like uh, picnics in the park and barbecues and hanging out together and really doing life together. And some of you possibly might have read that article and gone, man, did I miss some of those memos? Or like, I, I, I missed some of that. Like, and uh, and you, you didn't really miss 
like a lot of that is the casting of the vision of how we do life together because though it is so fulfilling to come and and sing the gospel and hear the gospel and respond to the gospel on Sunday morning in a corporate setting that's not really the way we get to know each other and do life with one another and hear each other's stories and as I look out here some of these people out here I, I know and I've known for years and years some of them watched me uh, grow up and could tell you some interesting stories about me um, and others I'm like wow I really can't wait to get to know uh, this person better and so what we're wanting to do this summer is to provide opportunities for some of that stuff to happen and if you read the article, uh, one of the things that we're offering uh, is on Tuesday nights at the bridge, if you um, are a, a woman, uh, it disqualifies about half of us, um, but uh, we, there is, they're going to walk through the book of Ephesians uh, Tuesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. And that actually is going to start as kind of like an intro thing this coming Tuesday night, and then they're going to jump into the book next Tuesday. Uh, the guys are a little bit behind the eight ball on uh, trying to figure out when the right time is for us to meet. Uh, so I'd be interested, actually, if you guys maybe on your way out mention to somebody like, hey, I prefer, prefer a breakfast Bible study before I head out to meet, to, to, meet, to work, or I prefer an evening uh, Bible study. Uh, and we're going to do that this summer, and then there's something else really cool going on in the fall that I'll talk to you guys about later. It was kind of mentioned a little bit in the article as well, but I'm not going to take any more time for that now. So that's Ephesians. There's also going to be a number of different things that we're going to be able to do over at Haskell Park, which is just that way. They have their summer kickoff on June 9th at like 5 o'clock. The bridge is going to offer, uh, provide food, hot dogs, chips, cookies, all that stuff. And then the Muni Band, most of you guys know, uh, they go out there and they play and do their thing Sunday evenings. And we're going to hang out and support them as well uh, and just kind of be able to do life at Haskell uh, Park on Sunday evenings and there's all kinds of other things that are in the works uh, that we're really excited about. There was a large number of people who came out and helped plant flowers with those shovel thinnies I talked to you guys about last week. You guys did an excellent job and then we had a number of people also that played frisbee uh, last Wednesday night. I think there was like a total of 52 people uh, out here for that event. So we're wanting to just provide opportunities opportunity for, hey, let's get to know each other. And some of that's going to happen spontaneously and some of that's going to be organized. But we are so excited that God has led you uh, to come and worship with us on Sunday morning. And basically, I'm saying all this to say one very short and simple thing. We're going to do more than just Sunday morning because we really care. I care about you and we all care about each other and we want to, you guys get the point. I'll be quiet now. The other thing I sometimes forget to do is, uh, uh, there, some people are like, hey, I want to give to the bridge. Like, how do I do that? You guys don't pass an offering plate. No, we don't. Uh, and one reason why we don't is because we, uh, uh, we want to in, in communicate to you guys, hey, uh, God loves the joyful giver and God just wants you just to kind of bring your tithe and be prepared in that way, uh, joyfully, etc. But there are some people like envelopes. Some people don't care. We have envelopes for those that like envelopes and for those that don't uh, like envelopes. That's cool. Don't worry about using those. And the other thing that this is as you feel led, okay, uh, to give. So all that to say, we're now ready to receive the benediction. Thank you so much for coming. My brain is fried right now. If you please stand, we're going to receive the benediction and God be with you as you go. Let's receive the benediction. And now to the great God who is able to heal us from our crippled state and bring us to the rescuer, Jesus Christ. May he be the one that our eyes are fixed upon. And as our eyes look to our rescuer, may we be part of the rescue mission that Jesus will faithfully fulfill until the day he comes again. To you be the glory, God. Great things you have done. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.